So now that we have a, a VM, step two is we want to be able to get um, the code and the scripts that I'll be using as examples. And so we're going to be using JIT for that. So let me first introduce JIT. Who uses JIT or who has used JIT? Okay. Um, this is something that is actually very, very good um, to learn how to use. It's super simple. It'll make your life easy, easier. And out in the real world, this is what you can expect to, to find. Um, intro to JIT. Okay, so <clears throat> there's JIT is one of many um, source code control management systems. Okay, that, that concept goes back 30 years. Uh, has always been a necessary part uh, of the computer science software development process, right? Especially as the number of files associated with a, whether it's a product or a system or whatever it is that you're working on, as that grows, it becomes more and more difficult to maintain. Um, as the number of developers grow that work with the code, it becomes very difficult to coordinate. So, JIT is uh, probably the, the most commonly used source code control system at this point. Um, so, <clears throat> there's, uh, JIT is an open source uh, system. So, in other words, uh, we can download and access all the code associated with JIT. With JIT, Think of it as there's two components. There's the, the actual repository component, and then there's the client components, right? And so GitHub, which you've probably heard of, um, is a uh, repository. Um, it uses Git, and it's... Um, <clears throat> widely used by the open source community. So in other words, um, all of us could get an account on GitHub, and I actually urge you to do that. Uh, and you can create your own repositories. So if you are developing something, um, you can put it up on JIT. If you're working on a project uh, in another class with a group of people, and it's, there's source code involved, uh, put it up on JIT. It just makes it easy for everyone to be able to pull, get the most recent files. If you make changes, push uh, back into the repository and a ton of capabilities to handle change management, right, and track it. We're going to be effectively baby users of JIT, so just the uh, that's probably the, <coughs> the commands that, um, that we'll, we'll be using this semester. Uh, there's probably a couple hundred more commands that are available. Um, our repo is buffet, right? uh, which is... School of Computing Managed Thing. So if you go to the uf.cs.comsa.edu, I actually don't know what you all would see. Um, what do you see when you go there? Like what we're looking at here is all of the repos that I've created. So you may see something you've created. Um, Let's see. <laughs> to, for our class, the repo, this is the name. Um, CPSC 360, 3600 students. And 
I actually have the JIT clone command with the full address on the web page, which I'll bounce back to in a second. So you can just copy and paste it. Okay. But um, let me just continue sort of walking through this. Let's say we wanted to create a new, something new. Well, buffet supports databases or repos. So let's say we want to create a new repo. Um, you, you, any of you could do this. Um, you give it a name. And um, the reason I'm going through this is so I can explain this button. So um, if you click public, then um, that would allow anybody <coughs> to have read access to the files. Okay, so anybody could do a JIT clone or a JIT get to pull everything. You wouldn't be able to push um, into a repo that I've set up for our class, for example, because it is designated as public. Um, there is, through the management interface here, I could and will have, uh, like our TA will have read-write access to the stuff that's in our, our repo. Okay, um, so when we do a JIT clone on the repo, and, and like I said, I'll give you the URL, the full path name of the, our repo. Uh, effectively, what a JIT clone does is it's making a local version of the repo on your machine. Okay, and so you could do... Um, make changes to anything. Um, if I don't have the commands that would show if you were if you did have write access and wanted to push back into the main repo, the command would be um, a JIT add and then a JIT commit. Then a JIT push. Okay. Um, in our case, you'll do one time, well, you can do this as many times as you want. You can do a JIT clone on any number of machines. Um, you would then, after, that would give you basically a snapshot. Okay. And um, if you were to modify any of the files within the tree, um, of the code that was downloaded for you. If you tried to do a JIT pull, which basically is telling JIT, give me any updates, it would probably give you an error saying, hey, something, you've changed something. Do you really want me to do this? Because it's easy to overwrite changes. So you have to be very aware. Um, <clears throat> What I would suggest is you, in one directory, you have the sort of a clean repo. And then when you're doing whatever it is that you know, I've asked you to do through a, an exercise working with starting code that's in the repo or homework that's using code from the repo, you copy it into a different directory path and you work on it there. Um, that way, you don't have to try to fix the problem of a JIT pull not working correctly. Okay, but it's going to happen, I'll guarantee it. Uh, and that's okay, it's easy to fix. As long as if there's anything that you've changed, just copy it someplace else then the procedure is going to be basically um, do a reset. And that 
effectively will remove all of your any changes or new files that you create. So again, warning, warning, warning. It's easy to mess up. Um, JIT status will tell you uh, if your local repo uh, is consistent with what's on Buffet, the main re repo. Uh, JIT diff will help you track down any changes. Uh, okay, and, and these are a couple of methods. If a JIT poll fails, uh, Sometimes a gset dash dash hard works. A jit clean dash n might be necessary. The more traditional way of dealing with this, if you're a developer working in a group and you do have right access to the code, um, and let's say you made a bunch of changes, but you need updates. Okay, so you would issue a JIT stash, which basically, it's really cool. It basically would take all of your, the code that you've updated and place it someplace temporarily. You could then do a JIT poll. And if you just wanted to overwrite the files that you've modified, you would then do a JIT stash pop to place it over. But again, you need to be careful, right? Because what if somebody else modified one of the files that you modified? Then you would have to do uh, like JIT diff to see the difference. Uh, JIT has commands that, that help merge. Um, it's super powerful, but uh, it, it's, it's what we'll be using. So, okay, so the point here is if you wanted to install the actual sort of main repo code on your own system, which um, would effectively be like buffet. Right, but you can do it on your own. You, this shows you how to do it. So, uh, from your uh, VM or from whatever Ubuntu machine that you're on, you you would use apt get install, which is how we um, would get any package of interest to us. Uh, and the package name for JIT that contains everything is JIT. And there's a whole bunch of setup stuff that you have to do, and we're not going to get into that. All right. So before I go into our VM and step us through what exists now, Distributed systems. <clears throat> okay, and this this is actually a um, a topic which, as we'll find out, is, is a superset of what we're going to be focused on in, in the class. Uh, and and there's other CS and ECE classes that cover other portions or areas of distributed systems. Uh, okay, so a distributed system, a collection of independent computers that appear to its users as a single coherent system. Uh, <clears throat> it's those words are actually similar to how we'll describe the internet. 
So the internet is a network that um, provides to users a unified network, a single network, even though the internet is actually composed of hundreds of thousands of little tiny networks. So a distributed system, just keep in mind it includes the networking component and it also includes the computing component. Okay, and you probably have seen this in some class somewhere or another. There's um, different approaches to building software systems, right? So centralized, decentralized. Um, there is a difference between sort of an, an architectural uh, view of the system, which again could be centralized or uh, decentralized or a hybrid. And then if we looked at specific functions or services or algorithms running within that system, they also could be centralized or run in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. Okay, so um, this is a pretty standard picture of a software distributed system uh, or a distributed system. Uh, it consists of multiple machines and each machine would have local uh, host stuff, right? So the local operating system, whether it's Linux or Windows or whatever. Um, <clears throat> then there's this magic layer called middleware, okay, which is the, the glue that, that holds the system together um, presenting a set of system services to distributed applications. Um, so in, for example, the research that I do in my lab, and Mandine is one of my PhD students, and she's in the middle of all this. Uh, so we have a, an IoT, Internet of Things framework, and, and you know, our picture can be cast to look something very similar to this. <clears throat> okay, so now network programming. So distributed computing is computing performed in a distributed system. Distributed programming would be a program that's working with the middleware. Right? The then network programming would be sort of at a lower layer, the building blocks. And so going back to our picture, um, there might be some network programming in this middleware service software, there uh, would be network programming components to support that system on the local OS. Um, and depending on the distributed applications, it may involve um, not just the middleware services, but it might also involve sort of traditional network programming. And so our focus for the semester is on network programming and trying to understand what that means. All right, so again, more terminology here. Um, so they call this distributed computing paradigms. There's something called message passing. Okay, so think um, almost texts would be an example, right? I mean, you type 
create a message, boom, goes out, and eventually it gets to one or more destinations. Um, there's in in the world of IoT, there's message passing um, has uh, means um, something pretty important. Bless you. It's um, there's a uh, uh, an approach to there's different approaches to message passing. So Unix defines APIs that support message passing. Okay, um, there's another approach that again is not new. It's been around for probably 20 years, which is based on a model called publish and subscribe. So a software, a piece of software that has information or a message publishes and it would go to a, what's called a broker, and entities, so software components that are interested in certain types of information would do a subscribe to the broker and would indicate the topics of interest. And so when data or messages come, they'll have a set of topics uh, associated with them. And the job of the broker would then be to disseminate those messages to the interested parties. So that is message passing. Client server um, is what we'll be starting with. Um, it's just a better match for network programming. So you know, this gets into the examples that I started out with last week. Uh, you have two programs running on a host, each running on a host, which is a computer, and there's a network in between. And um, typically, the uh, one will be a server, and one will be a client, right? So a example of that would be like a web server, okay, um, which the server would start and would run forever serving any client that sends the correct protocol information to engage the server. And the client would have uh, software that's sufficient to be able to effectively interact with the server. You know, the nature of the interaction is typically get something and the server replies with the result or the answer. Uh, peer -to -peer. <coughs> so um, maybe there's an application that um, could run in a client server model, but maybe it's a bunch of distributed wireless nodes, and it's difficult to assign one to be the server, because in a wireless network, you know, connectivity comes and goes, and so the server um, may not always be available. So peer-to-peer -peer would be a method or a model of writing an application um, assuming there's not a central ser server. And so, you know, that really imposes more of a burden on each client or peer. Uh, but it is an effective method um, in certain situations. Just to clarify, yes. it's like all the devices end up sort of sharing the roles of the server. Exactly. Correct. Right. And so um, the information uh, could then be perhaps distributed across a number of different nodes. Um, or, you know, the, the classic case uh, was with BitTorrent, and that was the peer-to-peer uh, -peer 
uh, application that you know, sort of came upon us a long, long time ago, right? And um, anybody know why that application, okay, which basically was sharing of anything, right? Pictures, videos, whatever. Um, anybody know why client server model was not a good fit and a peer to peer model was actually a better fit? Well, the data center that you have to have for all the data would be massive. That's one. And Correct. the second would be uh, like security reasons, right? Correct. Right. And third could be legal reasons. <laughs> so peer to peer is an effective way of obscuring who has what and who's doing what. And later in this semester we'll talk a little bit about uh, blockchain and sort of what, what's driving that. Um, it's somewhat similar to um, the peer-to-peer -peer discussion in a uh, BitTorrent context. I think there's some similar Okay. Okay, so issues in a distributed system. Uh, we'll see that all of these apply in network programming as well. Um, communication facilities. Okay, it's saying hide the low level message passing through the network from the upper layers. So map that to when I talked about the um, the seven layer network stack model, right? The, the benefit is that each layer above doesn't need to know the details of what's going on below. That's what that thing, is, that line is saying. Naming, um, so there needs to be a way for entities that are participating in the distributed system to learn of each other and of services available, uh, typically called a discovery process. Synchronization, so depending on the application, and um, synchronization in behaviors of uh, different nodes might be super important. Um, so for example, uh, autonomous vehicles, right? So clearly there needs to be a, an awareness by each node of other nodes and other obstacles. Um, and <clears throat> so synchronized in terms of you know, the surroundings, uh, there could also be the need for synchronization in time. So for example, it might be important for a set of peers to do something at the exact same instant. Okay, and so the issue of how to, um, how to time sync computers is actually a big deal. Um, and we'll actually use that as one of our sort of applications of interest to help us learn network programming. Um, <clears throat> consistency and replication, so I would lump that with fault tolerance and also security to some degree. So basically, the system needs to be very robust. Things can go wrong. Uh, it could be errors pop up, software errors, could be hardware failures, could be um, nodes, malicious nodes that are attempting to uh, distract or cause problems. All right. So today is the 15th, and um, <clears throat> Yes, you keep these um, PDF files.
file is always on your site. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. And <clears throat> as, like I said before, I'm still trying to fix links, so there's likely going to be uh, a bad link. And feel free to email me of those bad links because I'm trying to fix them. Um, this is the disadvantage of not using Canvas. So I've, I've done both Canvas and using this. And this is, takes a little bit more time, but I could do more with this. It's a bit more flexible. Um, <clears throat> okay, so homework one. He, my goal is to get that out by our next meeting, and that will be due two to three weeks after that. So we'll talk about that um, next time. Uh, <clears throat> on your VM, okay, so... As I said, you're going to want to do this command on your VM. So you can copy and paste. Copy. You go to your VM. Yes? Uh, we need to do this for both our VMs. Okay, so I'm glad you asked that. So again, there's. Um, we're only going to use one VM. And I know that the there's pages up there that talk about two VMs. Okay, I in for this class I've used two VMs in the past, but for this semester one VM. So does it matter which one we use if we use um, Kali or Ubuntu? Um, let's see. I would recommend uh, Ubuntu, but. Um, If you're, I think it'd be safer if you use Ubuntu because then all the code is going to compile correctly, and that may not be the case on Kali because I'm not. Yeah. Um. Okay, so on your VM, you would should just be able to do. FYI, on any Linux machine I'm on, I always create a number of directories. So um, there's always I always create a temp directory. And then I always create a eval directory. Um, okay, so I'm going to step into temp. So that is the command which should <coughs> get download the local repo and, and uh, after the JIT clone, it'll create a directory which corresponds to the name of our repo, which is CPSC 3600-students. Um, <coughs> The copy and paste, okay, will only work if you enable copy and paste on the virtual box. So, okay, so if you go into devices, Say by directional. So by default, it's turned off. So I, by default, if I if I had not already set this to by directional, when I try to paste, it wouldn't have worked. Okay. So um, definitely do that. It will make your life much easier. Another thing that will uh, can be beneficial 
you can create a shared folder um, which effectively is going to be a folder that your host OS can access and your VM can access. So it's a nice way to transfer stuff. So, so for right now, this is what you'll see. You'll eventually see other subdirectories called homework, exercises, um, probably MATLAB. So, um, okay, so. Next time, I'll talk, I'll start out talking about Windows, okay, basically giving an overview. And so um, I'll come back to the bash script examples and talk about them at that time. In the code, okay, so don't get intimidated here. There's, there's a whole bunch of stuff, but this will take us through at least half the semester. Um, the, the stuff that we're going to start out with uh, will be the C++ examples and the fork and exec example. Okay. So um, next time we'll pick up talking about uh, Linux stuff and uh, probably dive into some operating systems. Kind of so for the homework, we get to